They say that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, but expecting different results. Church, for years, we have been joining in this insanity as part of the United Methodist Church. And as a whole, we have been declining in a myriad of ways. And our response has generally been the same by offering one of two responses, either to ignore the decline completely and thus not be truthful about our situation, or to offer new program tweaks on a regular basis, basis, hoping they would be the silver bullet to save us. And we've done this repeatedly, and the results have been the same. The decline has continued, and the insanity has continued. We on the visioning team have recognized that with the creation of a new conference is a new opportunity, a genuine opportunity for something significant, holy, and sacred to emerge. But in the face of our unwillingness to be truthful with ourselves and our propensity to look for quick fixes and the general cynicism that we so often, all of us, carry, can there really be any new hope for a new beginning? That is the question that arises before us and the question that faces us on asking, will this insanity continue? And listening to many of you, you have indicated to us a strong desire for us to be truthful about our mistakes, our shortcomings, and our failures. You have urged us to acknowledge our failings and to live into a new life, a brand new life, not just a tweaking of programs. Anything short of this leads into cynicism and disillusionment that for so long has characterized our insanity of decline. In short, this is the reality that we on the visioning leadership team are attempting to address. Visioning is all about new life, yet we realize that true new life will not come from the bishop, the cabinet, the visioning team, the conference staff, even us gathered here. Nothing short of a true move of God in an organic, Holy Spirit, Pentecostal way will lead us into new life. The only way to get to new life is in Jesus Christ and specifically in repentance before Christ. It is ludicrous to believe that we can move into any kind of new life completely by ourselves or find something hopeful completely by ourselves without first repenting of the old, flawed, messed up self. And this is not uncommon to us who call ourselves Christians. We share in this practice every single time that we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion, that through our repentance, we then discover new life in Christ. We therefore believe that it is time to begin anew, truly anew, by first taking a step of repentance and moving then where the Lord may lead. Only in this way can we avoid the insanity of tacked on programs and ignoring the reality around us. Only then can we dare to hope that life, rather than the cynicism we so often carry, may truly reign. And this is not something that can be forced upon us. The bishop cannot command this of us, nor the cabinet, nor the visioning team. This can only happen in a very organic, God-inspired way. And so we pray here this morning that that moment may be here, now, that this morning might be at least one step in that direction. Therefore, we come this morning and we pray for God's Holy Spirit to come upon us in a fresh and new way, doing something truly new, truly life-giving, truly inspiring, truly hope-filled. Holy Spirit of God, Please come upon us messed up folk and do something generally new. In spite of our cynicism, in spite of our thoughts of we've done this before, will you come? This cannot be forced upon us. Nobody can be forced to actually hope, to actually pray, to actually care. But what we can do is offer an invitation an invitation to repentance, to new life. So in the next few moments, I ask, 
can we respond together to that invitation? That through words of guidance this morning, based upon our celebration of communion, the words that we find in the order of word and table, that together we can truly repent. If we are longing for new life, if we are longing for the Spirit of God to come upon us again, then I ask us this morning, not simply to ask, but in our hearts, beg, plead, anything that we can do in our being to say, God, we believe that you have more for us still. We have messed up, but thank God you are in the business of dealing with messed up folks. Because that's us. So this morning... May we invite God's Holy Spirit into this place. And we pray, we ask, we plead. Can we just have a few sacred moments together this morning to say, Lord, here we are. Take us and use us and forgive us this day. We're going to put some words on the screen. We ask that you not only hear the words, but see these words as well, but don't say them aloud. What we ask is that you meditate on these words as we go through them. That this may truly be a time of repentance. That we come and make ourselves so very vulnerable before this holy God that we serve. Let us prepare our hearts as we share together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We confess that our lives of discipleship are more often based on convenience rather than a way of life lived in total commitment. We have failed to be an obedient church. Lives and statistics do not lie. Membership in the United Methodist Church has declined in the United States as a whole, in our jurisdictions, and specifically in our conferences. Jurisdictions such as ours in the Northeast have found it necessary to combine conferences, such as with the former Wyoming and Central PA conferences, in order to survive. We confess that these steps are being taken because we have failed in our task of making more disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. We confess... We confess that we have not done your will. We confess that we have worshipped the institution, administration, and finances of the United Methodist Church over the lordship of your Son, Jesus Christ. We have broken your law. We confess that in the past we have placed pastors in church settings based upon seniority, politics, and financial compensation rather than matching their spiritual gifts with the needs of the people they serve. We have rebelled against your love. We confess we are more often swayed by public opinion, politics, and the way it has always been done, rather than the love of your resurrected Son, Jesus. We have not loved our neighbors. We confess we have moved more into chaplaincy roles in our congregation to keep doors open for those who want someone to do their funeral service rather than creating mission outreach centers to go and make disciples of all nations.
and we have not heard the cry of the needy. We confess the voices of disgruntled administrative council members and the comfortable church matriarch and patriarch have drowned out the voices of those wanting to know Jesus in new and powerful ways. So, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, we pray. Have mercy upon us, Lord. We are sorry that we have allowed the policies of the church conference to be more important than living as the living, vibrant body of Christ. Almighty God, free us for joyful obedience. We ask that you give us the strength to truly move into a new creation of how we do conference as the body of Christ in the United Methodist Church, something genuinely of you, something that reflects you, something that gives joy to you even as it gives joy to us to be in step with your Holy Spirit. Through Through Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, our our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. As this video illustrates, we believe that despite the insanity of where we have been and in some ways where we are, God is not finished with us yet. Christ demonstrates this over and over again that in our brokenness as individuals and as a corporate body, God comes and takes and remolds us and offers new life as we repent in him. We thus then find the joy in the new life that we have been searching for and pain and cynicism eventually begin to melt away. We do believe that new life will emerge and that exuberance will once again fill our hearts. No longer will our faces be contorted in frustration, pain, hurt, but smiles shall radiate from us. As we gather this morning, Mike Biel has written a commercial message that we hope will further demonstrate the differences between our two former conferences and our new Susquehanna conference, and at the same time, put a smile, a reminder of hope upon our faces this day. Let us share together in that time. I'm a PC. I'm a Mac. You might think that we were those guys who used to star in those computer ads comparing PC and Mac computers. You know, I would say, I'm a PC, and he would say, I'm a Mac, and then we'd poke each other trying to convince you that one was better than the other. We're not them. We're just cheap imitations. But you have to do what you have to do when you have tight budgets. So this is what we could do for the conference. That's why we took this gig. I thought it would be clever if I were the PC, so I could say, I'm a PC. That makes me the prior conferences. You know, I'm proud to be the prior conference. I have seen so many good things happen over the years in our prior conferences. I guess I'm not too big on change. Take the King James Bible, for instance. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. I agree, PC. You have done some remarkable things in prior conferences. And I've been proud to have been part of your work. You were perfectly designed to be effective in the mission and ministry of the realities of your day. But... So if you're a NAC, a new annual conference, what's the big deal? I've seen many operating programs come and go to fix the so-called bugs in the system. Let's face it, aren't you really just renaming a few committees? initiatives and core values, you know, as they say, moving the deck chairs around on the deck of the Titanic. I can remember the good old days when we'd restructure and recommit and rename and re-everything. Those were great days in both prior conferences. PC, being a new annual conference is a big deal. We committed last year to start building a new conference from the ground up, questioning how we do everything 
We started with a clean hard drive or a clean sheet of paper. And we have been careful to ask the right questions, not to get in a hurry and get it all done, as much as to get it right. Right. I love the new letterhead and the new logo, but I don't see how we are that different from each other. A conference is a conference is a conference. So what do you do that's so different from what I did? Are you sure you're ready for this? I remember how upset you got with that whole Vista thing, and I don't want to go there again. You go ahead. I'll be just fine. Give it a shot. Well, for one thing, prior conferences were designed to make members. We counted members, trained people for membership, and believed that everyone wanted to become a member of something. And in those days, it was true. Remember back then? It was those who didn't attend church who were seen as different. You know, for a computer, your data is suspect. What's your point? Aren't we still making members? Well, yes, but making members isn't as important as making disciples. We've rediscovered Jesus' command to go and make disciples for the transformation of the world. As a knack, we believe that this is the very reason our local churches exist. And so with this clear mission guiding us, we don't want to make just members. We want to grow mature disciples. Isn't that kind of a play on words? You know, I say tomato, you say tomato. I like potato. And I like potato. I like tomato. And I like tomato. Potato. Potato. Tomato. Tomato. Wow. Tomato, tomato, and Rosemary Clooney. Who's Rosemary Clooney? George Clooney's aunt, but never mind. It's a generational thing. No, PC. It's a whole new mindset. It's about rethinking church. It's about reviving our Wesleyan heritage and realizing that our church's main goal is faith formation and world-changing action. We're learning to be proactive. We need to reach out beyond our walls to introduce people to Christ, much as the first century disciples did. Our old discipling method of sitting in a hen house to make a chicken, it doesn't work. Just because we go to church doesn't make one a mature Christian disciple. I hope this doesn't encourage that Mike guy, the DCM, to tell another chicken joke. It's almost like having a whole new operating system inside of you, isn't it? In the prior conference days, we tried programming our way to vitality. Even in the local church, we had the notion that more programs meant more people, meant more money, meant more happy members, which led to more programs, and we forgot about the work of faith formation and the raising up of leaders who could help transform lives and the world. Oh, it was great back then. I could hold a great big y'all come event, and people would love to come and be trained. We could do overnights and long weekends, and people just love to get together. You know, even if the quality of the event was so-so. Eh, Glad you mentioned that, PC. Programs seemed to work back then, but one size seemed to fit all. But our churches don't need programs anymore. They need effective tools and resources, which will help us to make disciples. So we're aligning our resources and their delivery with that in mind. It's a huge difference. That's why Connectional Ministries created the eTour. What's this e-tour thing all about? In my day, churches were willing to travel across the country for tools and for training. Well, and in your day, you didn't have the Internet. Our Connectional Ministries team, e-tour, brings the resources to the district level. They've already been to many of our 11 districts, and folks are already discovering resources and tools that they didn't know were available thanks to their shares of ministry. They're helping local churches to reach out into their mission fields right outside their church doors. Boy, things sure have changed. I remember the good old days when youth were an active part of our conference life. Good news, PC. Sorry about the pun. Instead of a conference-wide youth group, CCYM has reached out to young adults, and now the Young People's Ministry Council exists to help the local churches develop youth and young adult ministries right in their own churches through customized training and event opportunities. And I remember when our camps were opportunities for young people to meet Christ. So many young people met Christ right there in those holy places. Great news, PC. That's still true with our four camping and retreats ministry sites. But in the NAC, 
Those sites are finding new ways to resource, tool, train, and nourish souls through intentional expansion of learning opportunities for folks of all ages. Yeah, I remember the old PC days. People came from the furthest parts of the conference to come to regularly scheduled meetings, whether we needed them or not. And whenever we had a new idea, we'd just form a new committee. That kept everyone interested, you know? None of this go-to meeting, online conference call stuff. In the new annual conference, we're trying to be good stewards of God's gifts. We meet when we need to, we offer the option to call into meetings from long distances, and we're trying to save as much paper as possible by posting things on our newly designed website. Hopefully the day will come when every church will have high-speed internet available in their area. But everyone's trying. I heard just this morning that somebody in the far northwest part of the conference finally finished downloading last year's pre-conference materials via dial-up. But it's going to get better. Wait a minute, what's happening to the structure? I would love all of those diagrams with the boxes and the arrows showing who's in charge of this and who makes all of the decisions and all that stuff. At one time, we could hardly fit the entire diagram on one page of paper. Well, that's another big change that's already happening. Some of our committees and boards have already streamlined their work through fewer people and less rubber stamping. They've realigned themselves around three primary tasks of the annual conference, and other boards and committees are doing the same. Some of the structures can't be changed because of the discipline, but by putting the mission before the structure, we can align all we do in places that really will make a difference. Restructuring is happening as we grow into better ways to undergird our mission and ministry. Back in the PC days, we had more answers than questions. How about you, NAC? Do you have more answers than questions? Not really, PC. The NAC has the vision leadership team, which works side by side with the cabinet in providing the oversight for our future. The visioning leadership team is charged with asking the really big, formative, adaptive questions that can help us rethink church, rethink our conference in an ongoing way. We're trying to become a learning community whose goal is to get it right rather than just get it done. You know, there are still more PCs than there are NACs. Yeah, it'll take a while for some conferences to catch on. Some are really stuck in the old paradigm of institutional church. Hey, it's been great to talk to you again, Nack. I really miss these chats that we have. We should do it again sometime uh, <clears throat> soon. That would be great. We've got a lot to talk about. There's a lot of challenges still ahead of us. But with God in charge, we face a future of hope as we do ministry to make disciples.